And as they're leaving, I just want to start by saying what a joy it is to serve here at CAS. It really is a blessing for me just to serve our young people, our teenagers, on Wednesday nights in South Buffalo. Uh, we're entering into week three of our ministry season, and it's just such a blessing. Uh, and it's an extra blessing. It's really a joy to, to bring God's word to you again this morning. Uh, if you don't know who I am, we've never met before. My name is Joe. I'm one of the elders here at Casanova Park Baptist Church. And I want to ask you just two questions as we get started this morning. And the first question is this. What do you hate waiting for? I know that's a strong word, that word hate, but what do you really, really, really not like waiting for? There's got to be something. And I'm going to ask for a little congregational participation this morning. This may not be usual, but I'm wondering if you're brave enough, if you're bold enough, would you yell out for us something that you don't like waiting for? It could be anything. Food? To be cooked? Is that pressure for Lydia? <laughs> uh, we're getting real quick. What else do you not like waiting for? What's that? A bus. Yeah. Anything else we don't like waiting for? Traffic. I have to get from the 290 to the 90 every day I come here to this church. And that stretch at Walden there, when those converge, man, terrible. Um, what else don't we like waiting for? Waiting in line for lots of things. Could be amusement park rides, grocery store line, all sorts of things. Doctor's office, that's the most painful wait of all. Now we're getting real. Um, especially if you know it's going to be bad news, probably. Um, there's a lot of things I don't like waiting for, but I'll tell you one of them. Um, and this happened to me just a several weeks ago now, actually. It was back on August 24th. I had to look back in the calendar. That was a Saturday. Um, one of the things I hate waiting for the most is gas at the gas station. I dread that. Anything car-related, I dread like the plague. When my car's up, my lease is up in February. I do not enjoy buying cars, and I don't enjoy getting gas for them either. Um, this particular Saturday, my mother and I were in the car together. I was the chauffeur for the day. She was riding shotgun, and we had lots of things to do. Uh, we had to get to the pharmacy. We had to go to the grocery store. I wanted to go to JCPenney's. She wanted to go to some other stores. Uh, I'm trying to put down money on a condo. I'm supposed to close on condo number two now. We're trying this again uh, next month. Pray for me. Uh, October 25th is supposed to be my closing date. And so my mom wanted to look at some house stores with me just to get ideas. So we're running around all day. And in the midst of that, my gas is getting low. I'm between empty and a quarter of a tank, and so I told my mom we're going to have to stop and get gas. And I happen to have a BJ's Wholesale Club membership, which is helpful when you're buying bulk snacks and, and stuff for youth. It comes in handy. And uh, we're going up Sheridan Drive in the North Towns. And so I told my mom, let's stop and, and get gas. I realized as soon as I pulled into the parking lot why I don't get gas on a Saturday afternoon. At about 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it was loaded with cars. There's people everywhere. And this is the game that I have to play, and maybe some of you do this too, because we do this in the grocery store line too. I'm trying to figure out which line is going to get me done the fastest. And then in my flesh, I start to judge people. I'm like, well, these first two lines are 65 years and older people. We're going to skip those lines, right? I'm sorry. I'm just telling you straight. I'm looking at this one line of cars. It's three cars deep. And so I'm like, we're definitely not going to go in that line. Every other line has two cars. But there's one line that has only one white van in it. And the guy's already pumping his gas. And so I think, this is it. Joe's going to pick the right one. We do this in the grocery store, too. I'm sure someone else does. It's not just me, right? Um, and I'm like, this is the line. And so we start to get through the, the BJ's, the way that they have it structured there on the corner of the boulevard in Sheridan, and I, I pull behind this white van. And it's an older man, but he's already just about finished pumping. And so I think to myself, yes, I picked the right one. Good job, Joe. And he finishes, and he prints the receipt. And I'm like, yes, this is it. My, my, my foot starts to like ease off the, get, you know, the brake pedal, and he doesn't get in the car. Wait for it. Uh, he begins to walk behind the van to the passenger side. And so I think to myself, well, maybe I assumed incorrectly, maybe the wife's driving, or maybe his friend's in, the, in the, the driver's seat, and I can't see his head. No big deal. I'll be getting my gas any minute. He doesn't go into the vehicle. Uh, he opens the van sliding door, and he reaches in. And my mom next to me is like, what is he doing? At this point, the line of three cars to my left has become two. And he reaches in at a 
he pulls out an empty five gallon gas canister. And so I said, okay, that's no big deal, just a few more minutes, and he sets it on the ground. And he reaches back in to the van, and he pulls out a second five gallon gas canister that's empty. And this guy's an old man, so he's like, you know, as he gingerly grabs him, and he finally, slow as slow could be, it seemed like, it looked like an eternity, he walked back to the pump and he set them down. And then he just stood and he stared at the pump for like 30 seconds. And now my mom's trying to get aggravated because we wanted to get to the pharmacy down on Sheridan. We had other things to do. And she's like, Joe, what is he doing? I'm like, I don't know. He looks lost. He just did this just fine a second ago. And then I, a light bulb goes off and then he must realize it. He already printed his receipt. He ended the transaction. He didn't mean to. He wasn't done yet. And so now the old man starts to fumble in his pocket. He finds his BJ's membership card and he scans it. And then eventually he, he misplaced his credit card. I can tell he's rummaging through his wallet trying to figure out where he shoved that. By the time he was done, the three cars to my left had all gotten gas and had left the vicinity of the parking lot before I ever pulled up to the pump. I might have been the last one to get gas in that original line. We don't like waiting, do we? We don't like waiting for much of anything. And I realized this morning, most of you are probably waiting for something way bigger than gas at BJ's Wholesale Club, right? You're probably waiting for something so much more important, more significant than that, something that matters to you way more than gas at BJ's. Some of you are waiting for that check to clear. Some of you are waiting for that good diagnosis from the doctor. Some of you are waiting for your marriage to get better. Some of you are waiting for that friendship to get fixed. Some of you are waiting for that job promotion that you're certain you deserve. Some of you are waiting for that conflict to be resolved. You and I are waiting for lots and lots of things. We're bad at waiting, especially because we live in a world that's instant gratification led. We want things and we deserve them now, right? I can go on Amazon Prime, I'm blessed to be able to pay for that, and in two days an item just shows up to my house. I don't have to even leave. But we don't want to wait for things. The second question I want to ask you, I want you to think about. Don't share it out loud anymore. The second question is this. What are you waiting for right now, currently, today? What are you waiting for? What does God seem slow on? What are you waiting for? I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as we open today's text, as we turn to James chapter 5. I want you to keep whatever that thing or those things are in the back of your mind as we read verses 7 through 12 in the book of James here. This is written by Jesus' half-brother, James, but I want you to know this morning everything in this book is completely true, 100% true. Um, and as we read this together, I'll be in English Standard Version. Many of you have that Bible out in front of you. We're going to read James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. I don't know about you, but this is a book, like so many in this Bible, that just have spoken to me again and again and again. It's a book I return to often. I think there's probably a reason for that. Let me read to you verses 7 through 12. Please. Do you mind putting those on the screen for me, Dan? He says, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And then he ends here in verse 12, this passage. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we are an impatient people. We want lots of things and we want them now, and so often we 
we believe we're in the right and that we deserve these things, and, and yet we're so impatient. Help us this morning, Father, to see how patient of a God you are with us. I pray, Father, that you would help me get out of the way so that the Holy Spirit could move in this room this morning and speak to people, truly convict them, help them open their eyes, open their ears to the gospel, why we need Jesus, why we are singing songs like the ones we sang this morning, that we want Jesus to come. Help us to understand our need, our desperate need for a Savior. And then in the midst of all the things that we're waiting for, uh, help us to find patience in that, Father. Help us to look to you, to your word this morning. I just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. This book, the book of James, was written perhaps as early as 45 AD. What does that tell us? That tells us that this most likely is the very first letter written in the New Testament, one of the very first epistles written in the New Testament, although it's towards the back of your Bible. James is considered by many um, to be in this book, kind of giving us a New Testament book of Proverbs. Some consider it that way. Uh, I find that interesting because I'm in a Bible study with some men right now. We're reading through the actual book of Proverbs. Um, this book is also, in many ways, a commentary of sorts on a much greater message, on a sermon given by Jesus, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And I think last time I was up here with you, we were in the Sermon on the Mount talking about anger. What I want to do this morning is truly get myself out of the way so that you can see three things this morning that I think James makes pretty clear to us as we kind of unearth this text together. Uh, I want us to grapple with our pain and suffering, because I know there's lots of people here that might be watching at home or listening to this at some point throughout the week that are struggling with lots of things, especially lots of things that we're waiting for. I mean, we're a church that's waiting right now for a lead pastor. We're in the midst of transition ourselves. And so I, I want to help you see some ways in which that we wait for the Lord while suffering. Because as I reminded students this past week, you know, Jesus promises us trouble in, in John 16, 33. He says it won't be easy. Uh, all those prosperity gospel guys on TV must skip that spot. You know, I want us to see how do we wait for the Lord while suffering. And so first, we're going to look again at verse 7 and 8. James says, verse 7, be patient. Underline that word. Highlight it. Circle it or something. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be, what's the word? Patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So first, we wait with patience. We wait for the Lord with patience. Are there any farmers here this morning? I'm not a farmer. Is anyone here a farmer this morning? I figured... Possibly not. That's okay. Um, I grew up in Eden, New York, about 20 minutes south of here, so it was in farm country that I lived. Um, so there were lots of farmers around. I remember having to dr drive your tractor to school day, which still happens in Eden. Um, maybe some other school districts do that too. That was always a hoot. And um, if you don't know about Eden, New York, really we're just known for our corn. We have a whole festival about it, which already passed. August came and went, but um, I'm thinking about Eden corn right now as I was reading this passage this week. Um, you can't go into farming unless you're patient. Why? Because you have to do lots of waiting. Uh, there's a part of the job description as a farmer that you control, and then there's a part that is completely outside of your control. And farmers know this. Um, let's just take the corn farmer for an example because I can think of that easily. Um, the corn farmer has to care for the field, then he has to plant the corn seed. He's got to apply the necessary fertilizer. He's got to perhaps make sure that the corn is out of some places where predators, you know, animals can't get to it, especially when birds are trying to pick that seed in the beginning. He has to wait during all this, but he has to manage the growing season, and then eventually he has to harvest the crop, right, when it's ready. Um, but he has to wait. He has to wait for a certain time to plant. He has to wait for the spring rain and eventually the autumn rain. They don't really harvest corn here and eat until, you know, August, September, October, right now. And he waits until the exact right moment to harvest all that corn. And then eventually I go to the Eden Corn Festival and it's already buttered and salted and ready to go for me, right? And in James's time, everyone understood this because they lived in an agrarian society. 
Uh, we still do, but a lot of us, as I just saw, aren't farmers. Maybe we're not thinking about that all the time. They lived in a place where they would have perfectly understood what James is talking about here. And the amount of waiting, the, the, the circumstances that were beyond their control. The example of the farmer reminds us to be patient, especially in circumstances that are outside of our control. And then in verse 8, James encourages us to establish our hearts. He says, establish your hearts. I could spend a lot of time on that sentence, but just briefly, um, he's saying that with your whole being, all of what you are, to pursue a lifestyle that is persistent devotion to God, like you are laser-focused on him, uh, to establish your hearts because he's coming back. So we're to focus our gaze on him and to love our Lord, our God, with all our heart, mind, body, and strength. Right? To love our neighbor as ourself. And then as we move to verse 9, we're reminded that the day of the Lord is at hand. And we shouldn't grumble or complain about it. But that's often what we do, especially when we're waiting. Verse 9 says, Do not grumble against one another, brother, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the capital J judge is standing at the door. Can I ask you another question this morning? What do you want to be doing when Jesus comes back? What do you want to be doing when Jesus comes back? Maybe some of you have asked this question to yourself before. What do you want to be listening to? What do you want to be watching? Who do you want to be with? It's in many ways my prayer that when you get home today from church, Jesus comes back. But Maybe it'll happen right now in the parking lot. What do you want to be doing when he comes back? And then there's some of us, if we're being honest this morning, that would go, I just don't know what he's waiting for. Like, what is taking him so long? You know, 2,000 plus years have passed. Like, when is he coming? He says he's at the door. He's knocking. Like, where is he? Why won't he show up in this matter of my life that's really important to me? Like, where is he at? We've all asked this question. Does he not see that our world is broken, that there's a whole lot of evil happening, like that people, our culture is actively rebelling against the things of God, and then we celebrate that? Like, does God not see all the horrible things happening in my life? I thought he was coming back. Where is he? Let me give you the words of the apostle, Peter. He reminds us in 2 Peter 3, 9, that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness but is, there's that word again, patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. What is God waiting for? He's waiting for you. He's waiting for me. He's waiting for us to live on mission, to do what we were supposed to do, to make disciples in all the nations, to make disciples right here in western New York. That's what he's waiting for. He's waiting for some of you this morning. Maybe you came here as a guest. Maybe you're a member of our church and you call this place home. Maybe you're here from another state. Maybe you're from who knows where this morning. He might be waiting for you. And some of us don't understand just how patient our God is with us, how patient he is with this fool up here, me. He wants to rep us to repent. He wants to save as many people as possible. He wants you to make that 180 and to think differently and to repent, and, which means to go the other way, to think of the things and live for the things of God and not live for the things of this world that James is telling us are passing away. But we want God to deal with evil, don't we? And we see it everywhere. You're scrolling through your social media feeds. You see it in the news. You probably watched the debate last week, whatever you want to call that. And you're probably thinking to yourself, why can't God just deal with evil? There's so much of it. Right? Like, that's what we want. Where should he start? Should he start with the rapists? Or the people who look at pornography in this room? Should he start with the adulterers or the ones who've just lusted over people? Should he start with the murderer? Or some of us that have looked at people with so much hatred and contempt, Jesus says it's the same thing. Where do you want God to start? It's hard because we, we draw this imaginary line in the ground and we say, God, deal with all of that, but not over here. I'm good. 
We draw this line in the sand and we say, fix all that evil, and we never once think about ourselves. If God dealt with all evil right now, if he abolished it right here, right now, today, he'd have to deal with you and me. And that should be sobering for us. We need a Savior. We really do. And we focus on so many things. And I know there's some really legitimate things that we're waiting for in this room. But there's lots of junk and garbage and mess and sports and stuff we're waiting for, too, that'll be forgotten about. I don't know about you, but I don't remember my great-great-grandfather's name. I don't know what he did for a living. I don't know his favorite color. He was alive 50 years ago. I've forgotten him. The reality is, in about 50 years, you will be forgotten. I will be forgotten. Except that we're not forgotten by God. Oops. If we trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our name is written in the book of life, then we're not forgotten. The reality becomes, what are you going to do about Jesus? That's what's going to be remembered. And God had to deal with evil, and so he sent his one and only son into this world. That's whoever believes in him will not perish, but what? Have eternal life, right? John 3, 16. Maybe one of the most important verses in all of Scripture. This is how patient our God is with us, but yet we're so impatient. The Son of God was brutally murdered on the side of the road so that you, yes, you this morning, would come to him. It says we learned last week, so that you then can call God your good shepherd. You're not a child of God before that. Our God is so patient. And so we need to wait on the Lord with patience. Second, second thing I want you to see in this text this morning is that we wait for the Lord with steadfastness. I debated what word to use here, but our text has this word, so maybe that'll be easier for you to remember. Let's look at verses 10 and 11a together. Verse 10 says, As an example of suffering... And patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. James is reminding his Jewish brethren, the people are reading this letter originally, of the prophets of old and their steadfastness, their singular focus on God. They were to be a voice for God. They were supposed to tell the people what the Lord was usually warning them about, that some sort of judgment was coming, right? There are five major prophets and 12 minor prophets in the Bible, and all these people were steadfast. They acted as the Lord's voice. They were trying to tell people to leave their adulterous ways, to, to follow God, right? And most of them, a lot of times, they went on deaf ears. Um, prophet's life was difficult. There's lots of prophets we could talk about this morning, but one that came to my mind, I was studying his story this week a little bit, was the prophet Jeremiah. I don't know how many of you are familiar with his story. Jeremiah was only about 17 years old. I was thinking of my teenagers this week. He was only about 17 when God called him. And yet he loved the Lord. He was faithful. He was steadfast. And in the middle of this incredible book, in, in chapter 42, I was reading this week how Jeremiah has to answer a question for the people. He, and he needs the Lord, I should say, to answer a question for the people. The people, God's people are trying to figure out, do we stay where we are or do we go to Egypt? What do we do? And they're like, whatever the Lord says, we're going to obey. And we think, oh, that sounds great. Like, you know. And so Jeremiah prays to God in chapter 42 and asks the Lord what the people should do. He doesn't get an answer that day or the next day or the next day. He has to wait 10 days for an answer. Probably felt like an eternity for some of those people. And it's fascinating because at day one, these people are like, we're going to do whatever the Lord tells us to do. By day 10, it changes. Finally, as always, God keeps his promise. He answers. He answers. And he tells them that they are to stay where they are, right? That they are to stay here and not go to Egypt. That if they go to Egypt, the things they're afraid of are going to come to pass. That they're going to be ruined. That they're going to be judged. He tells them to stay. And so Jeremiah tells the people. And these people, what do they do? They're like, you're lying, Jeremiah. You're a liar. That's not what God said. Certainly we must have to go to Egypt, right? And so they do what so often you and I do. We just go our own way. We think we know best. And so they go to Egypt. They don't listen to Jeremiah. How frustrating that must have been for him. And they go to Egypt and they're destroyed. God warns them, but they go anyway. And so often, I don't know if that sounds like any of the people in this room, but I've had moments like that in my life. 
We think we know better. They're all wiped out. Outside of the prophets, and some of you have probably seen this before or, or talked about this before, but let's really quick, let's just think about some of the men and women of our faith that have had to wait. Think about Abraham. He had to wait 25 years. Think about Noah. He has to wait 120 years. Noah's told his whole lot in life is to build a boat. He'd never seen rain before. His neighbors think he's a, a nut job. Like, are you sure that's what the God said? Like, you're going to build a boat? Like, what are you doing, crazy Noah? And then 120 years later, after a week of waiting... It happens. They need a boat. Jacob waits 12 years. A story that's always spoken to me, Joseph, and not because we share the same name. He has to wait 13 years as he's sold into Egypt, into slavery, as he goes to prison because he's blamed for something he didn't do, right? And he has to wait 13 years to become the second most powerful person in all of Egypt. Moses wandered 40 years in the desert leading the Israelites. He doesn't even get to see the promised land. His successor, Joshua, we're not there yet. I don't want to step on Brother Angel's toes. We're going to get there. But he has to wait too. He's going to take out 32 kingdoms. We haven't even gotten there yet. He has to wait many years. And I don't want to spoil this. We're going to get there with Angel. But you know how many days he has to wait for the walls of Jericho to fall down? Does anyone know? Seven. Yeah. doesn't happen like that. And then there's Jesus, our Savior and Lord. He waits too. Jesus waits 30 years, 30 years until he begins his public ministry. He waits 30 years until he eventually, although it's always been on his mind, I'm sure, he waits 30 years until eventually he sets his sights on Calvary and he's laser-focused, locked in, that that's where he's always supposed to go. Knowing that he's going to be brutalized and humiliated and killed for us. Even Jesus waits as he let these people patiently crucify him on the side of the road like a lamb to the slaughter so even the son of God waited James is telling us here that we need to be steadfast like these people like these men and women unwavering in our commitment to God we need to be steadfast we need to find contentment in this because as Romans tells us he's always making things work for our good for those that trust in him right Romans 8, 28. Each of us must be like the prophets and wait for the Lord with steadfastness and satisfaction. James even goes a step further. He gives us another example. He gives us Job. I shared his story with our teenagers this past Wednesday. One of the hardest stories to read. If you don't know the story of Job, I just want to warn you, it's a bummer. In many ways, it's a downer story. It's one of the hardest books in the whole Bible, I think, to read. It's 42 chapters long. And in that story... Job loves the Lord. He's a faithful man. He's a God-fearing man. But horrible things happen to him. He's got boils all over his body. I mean, 10 of his children are killed. His way of living, his livestock and his land, all that's taken away. He, he loses almost everything, seemingly. He's even got his wife tell him, just curse God and die. Why are we still sitting here waiting, letting this happen? And Job, oh, Job, that the devil's able to do things to him, and yet he's able to write this in Job chapter 19. It just captured me this week. For I know that my Redeemer lives. Just saying the words this morning. And at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. I like tear up when I read this. My Redeemer lives. That's what Job is focused on. He is steadfast. God doesn't do those things to him, but it's tricky for us, right? Because he allows them to happen. Notice also that Satan has to go to Job to even ask permission to do these things, and he never once, his life is never in danger. God never lets him take his life. And Satan loses. He miscalculates because God is Job's everything. All that other stuff passes away. His Redeemer lives. And that should be our attitude and our hearts this morning too. But so often, no, we want that delivery. We want that good news. We want our life to be easy. We forget about John 16, and we want everything handed to us. At the end of the book, God restores Job. Everything he loses, he gets back double. 
He loses seven sons and three daughters. He has new children. But I know what we're thinking. That's a bad deal. I wouldn't take that deal. Those ten children don't come back to life. They're dead. That's a bad rap. I wouldn't do that, some of us say. Not if you understand what this book speaks to, that our Redeemer lives. His marriage is left in a wreck. He has to go through a lot of grief, but he knows that God keeps his promises. And we are to keep our promises too. And that's what we're going to spend a lot of time on this last point as we work towards the end of this passage. Finally, James tells us, James tells us one other thing, which is to wait for the Lord with integrity. And this is particularly challenging for me. Wait for the Lord with integrity. This should challenge our, our elders in this room, ministry leaders. I don't care who you are. This should challenge every single person in this room this morning. In verse 11b and 12, James says, You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Job's steadfast, but he's also a man of integrity. And that word shows up a couple of different times in his story, in chapters 2, 1 and 2 particularly. In chapter 2, we're told that he holds fast to his integrity. Even when his wife tells him to abandon God, he says, I'm doing the opposite. You foolish woman. He tells her, so I'm only to accept good things from God and not trouble? No. And it's amazing because every time we, I read that story, the story of Job, he never once sins with his lips. He never blames God. And that is not me up here. That's not some of us this morning. Hmm. Then in verse 12, this strange verse at the end of this passage. We're going to spend some time on this. He ends the passage by saying, But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. And this verse, maybe at first glance, seems like it's out of place. Like, where's James going here? The first 11 verses, he's talking about Job and the prophets and about patience. He's talking about God's merciful, mercifulness and his, and his compassion. We're talking about why he's here. He's at the door. All these things seem to connect. And then there's this verse at the end, which is like, don't pinky promise. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't swear by anything, by heaven or earth or anything else. And we're like, why would James say that at the end of this passage? Because then he's going to end the letter after this. He's talking about all these things, and he brings this up. These words should sound familiar to us this morning because they're an echo of Jesus' words. Why don't you check this out? It's in Matthew 5, 37. In the greatest sermon ever given, the Sermon on the Mount, these words are in red because they're Jesus talking. He says, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. And James would have known his half-brother's sermon well. Even though at first, James didn't believe his brother was the son of God. He thought he was a fraud. But then he sees his resurrected half-brother, the son of God, and he changes. He writes this letter. James is not just telling us to avoid using the Lord's name in vain here. He's going beyond that. He's saying, when you're a Christian, your yes better mean yes, and your no will be no for good reason. And this challenges me this morning. We need to be people that are trusted. And I think the capital C church has to do a better job at this because we're failing at it. We have to have integrity. We're not to just collect this golden ticket like we're going to Willy Wonka's, and then we just kind of sit on it and wait. We're supposed to have integrity. Why does this matter? Because you and I, we steward the most important, most life-changing, most incredible news the world has ever heard. And it's all true, 100% of it. Good people don't go to heaven. Patient people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And we have to make sure that our yeses mean yes and our noes mean no. Otherwise, why would people listen? And I know this is difficult. Like, I, we're going to give the Holy Spirit room to move because he'll do things that you and I can't do. We can't save people. Let me be very clear. We can't do that. Jesus Christ took our punishment so that you wouldn't have to pay for your sins for eternity. That should matter to you this morning more than anything else that you're waiting for. I say that with love. Jesus beat sin and death for us. It's the best news we could ever hope to hear. 
And if we want people to hear it, we've got to be people of integrity. And that's not just the elders and I trying to run this church the best we can as we're waiting for our next pastor. Some of us are going to have to get out of the pews and roll up our sleeves and do this stuff together. We're going to have to work together. We have to have integrity. There's there's holes here. We're, We're finding them out as we go. We have to have integrity. I'm going to be really careful with what I say here. I've got to be careful, but I do want to share an opinion with you, which could be dangerous. You can't chapter and verse this, so I want to be really careful here. But this is just my thought, and if we disagree, that's okay. Just make it clear this one thing is my opinion. Most people will believe a Christian before they believe in Christ. You may or may not agree with that. Most people will believe a Christian before they believe in Christ. Certainly, God can save anyone he wants to save. But in my life, I trusted my friend Josh long before I trusted Jesus. When he invited me to a Christian camp out in the middle of nowhere in East Delavan, New York, I didn't go because I wanted to learn about God. I trusted my friend. He had integrity. And let me be really straight with you because there's nothing I want to keep from anybody here. I went because I wanted to learn how to ride a horse. That's it. There was horseback riding, and my friend said there was, and so I trusted him, so I went. That's why I went. But at that camp, as a 12-year-old boy, Jesus called me, as we sang about earlier. He called my name. It became crystal clear to me. All the things that his family and my grandparents and the church had told me in youth group when I was in this building as a kid all suddenly clicked. I needed a Savior. I couldn't do this on my own, right? And that's what happens. Because someone had integrity, he didn't save me, but that's how it works, right? And so if you're going to be someone that says, hey, I'll be at the movies next Saturday at 7 and you don't show up, why would your friend then stop and say, well, wait a minute. So this God man died and came back to life. I don't believe you. I don't believe your gospel. I don't want your God because you didn't show up. We have to make our yeses and nos matter. This stuff matters. God keeps his word because it cost his son his life. So if you're someone who ghosts people, stop it. If you're someone that doesn't text people back, and man, some of those folks drive me crazy, stop it. Lovingly, please stop. If you're going to say you're going to show up and help a friend and you don't show up, you have no integrity. And this is challenging for us because we all struggle with this. I do too. I'm not perfect. Hardly. But if you're flaky and you're, you tell your friend you're going to be there at the movies next week and then you don't show up, why is he going to listen to you when you have the most incredible news to share with him? It's going to be hard. It's going to be impossible. Near impossible, not impossible, not for God, but James is imploring us to be people who, like our Lord and Savior, have integrity. Do you understand how this really matters to us, especially in a world today that is more confused and more lost and more divided than ever? We're worried about Democrat and Republican and white and black and this and that, and it's like, it's like Satan and his, all his demons just said, let's unleash division after the COVID came to an end. It was like, let's just make everyone divided. And then integrity got lost somewhere along the way, probably way before that. We have to have integrity. This is so important. I'm challenged by this as an elder, as a, as a youth director. Like, I need to have integrity. I need to show up. And you do too. Let me summarize what we've talked about. I'm not closing yet, but we're, we're getting there. In summary, while we're suffering in this life, because Jesus promised us some of that, we need to wait for the Lord with patience. We need to wait for the Lord with steadfastness. And we need to wait for the Lord with integrity. Can I go back to that second question that I asked you, if you'd let me for just a few moments, about what you're waiting for right now? What are you waiting for right now? Can I tell you the answer? I know the answer. (laughs) Can I tell you what you're waiting for? You're waiting for Jesus to come back. That's not a Jesus juke. That's not like, you know, playing pastor speak. You're waiting for Jesus to come back. Some of you are thinking to yourself, Joe, you're not very good at this. That's not at all what was in the back of my mind. It's not at all what I'm waiting for. In the grand scheme of things, it is. And I say that with love. It's a fact, even if you're in this room this morning and you have no idea who Jesus Christ is, and he went to the cross and thought of you the whole way, you're waiting for him to come back too. Because then there'll be nothing left to wait for. 
There will be nothing left to wait for. So many of the things that we're waiting for won't matter anymore. They're going to fall away. And some of the things that do matter, truly matter, they will be answered. It'll all make sense. I'll be wrong, will be made right. Our souls are ultimately longing for Jesus' return. When he comes back, there will be nothing truly left to wait for. I don't know if you believe that or not this morning. I do, with every ounce of my being. Whether I get that condo next month or not, when Jesus comes back, it won't matter anymore. Whether that surgery worked or not, it won't matter. Jesus is coming back. Do you understand? That's what you're waiting on. And I know that you're waiting for other things too, but that's what you're waiting for. So what are you waiting for? Why can't it be today? Why can't today be the day that you put your faith and hope and trust in Jesus? I hope he shows up when you're in the parking lot today. I really do. Hope that I don't have to go back to youth ministry this week, that it's just done. It's a wrap for me. I could just retire. Even though it's not a job, I just love doing it. James tells us that your life is but a vapor. It's here today, gone tomorrow. I was at a funeral yesterday. I drove to two and a half hours to Titusville, Pennsylvania yesterday. Well, I didn't actually drive. Let's get the credit where it credit's due. My mother drove two and a half hours. My cousin Tina and I just, you know, made it difficult for her the whole way down because we're like children in adult bodies. Um, had to stop for our Starbucks. We had to pee, you know, before we even got there. <laughs> That's my fault. Um, at that funeral, it was a beautiful celebration for me because I know Maya and Grace, who lived to the age of 83, is with her Lord and Savior. She's got nothing left to wait for. The national average, I told this to students this past week, like each of us on average in our country get to live for 76 years, so she outpassed it. Some of you are like, oh no, I'm really close to that number. I'm almost halfway there. That's not long. It's here and gone like a vapor. What are you going to do about Jesus? That's what matters. Because when he comes and the sky cracks open like a scroll, my students and I are reading through Revelation. We're not there yet. But when he shows up on a white horse, every knee is going to bow. Everyone will know it's him. There won't be any mistaking it. None. There'll be nothing left to wait for. So whatever it is that you're waiting for this week, remember, your Redeemer lives. Your Redeemer lives. And he is coming back. He is coming back. I want to close there. I think that's a good place to close. I want to lead us in a time of prayer, and then we'll close with the doxology. Hopefully I've given you something to think about as you go home today. There's no Bills game today, so there's no excuse. You've got time to think about this today. This is life and death stuff. Let's pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, you are oh so patient with us. Sometimes it's unbelievable. It's remarkable how patient you are with your people. Even at the end of Malachi, when they're waiting 400 years and they thought you'd never show up, then Jesus came down on the scene. And here we are 2,000 some years later and we're still waiting. And that seems like an eternity for us, but for you it's like a minute because you've lived forever. You've always been and always will be. 1,000 years for us, 10 years in the parking lot today, it won't matter a difference to you. Help us, Father, to wait. There are people in here who are waiting for doctor's visits and results that we hope come true. We're waiting for packages to be delivered to our houses this week. We're waiting for our jobs and promotions and things to get better in that front. We're waiting for, some of us are waiting for that guy to propose to us. Some of us are waiting for a new job. Some of us are waiting for a new car waiting for health problems to get better. We're waiting for all sorts of things. But as we wait on you, Lord, would you help us do it with patience? Because we can't do this by ourselves. Would you help us to be patient people? Would you help us to be steadfast people like Job and the prophets of old, the, the men and women who've come before us and who have laser-focused their lives on you, have loved you well and loved other people like themselves? And would you help us, Father? Would you guide us in how to live a life of integrity? So when we tell someone yes, they're like, that person keeps their promises. And they're all the more willing to listen to the greatest news that we have to tell them. Or our testimony, how you have changed our life and flipped it upside down. We know that that can only happen with 
your power, your Holy Spirit. We can't save people, Father, but help us to be people of integrity, men and women who keep their word like you do, so that people will see you in us, so that they'll wonder why we are the way we are, so that they will look to the gospel that is changing people's lives and saving people from their sin. We pray for those people this morning, Father, that may listen to this, that are maybe here this morning that have not repented and turned to you, that they have not believed in their hearts that Jesus Christ died and raised from the dead for their sins. We pray, Father, for them, that you'd have mercy and grace on them, that you'd help them see this morning their desperate need for your son and that he could come back at any moment. We don't know when that's going to be. We're structuring our lives around 401Ks and the bills schedule and all sorts of nonsense, Father, that won't matter. At the end of the day, it's going to pass away. And we can either spend an eternity paying for our sins or we can spend an eternity with you because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross when he bled and died for us, thinking about us the whole way. We pray for people this morning, Father. Have mercy and grace on them. Help our yeses to mean yes and our noes to mean no this week. Help us reflect the love of Christ. We're thankful for this church, Father. This is your church. You'll continue to, to run it and guide it as you see fit. Help us to wait faithfully, patiently. Help us to, to make the right decisions as a pulpit committee and as a group of elders, as a church, ultimately sometime in the future, Father, as we're thinking about who's going to be the person that you have predetermined is going to continue to run things here and, and help oversee things here at Cass Church. Help us to trust you in that waiting too. And I just pray, Father, that uh, as the people leave this morning, that they would look to you in your word, that they would see that this, even this letter written by James, the half-brother of Jesus, it's 100% true, every word of it. Unlike our culture that constantly changes, unlike our personal taste that change by the minute, your word is always constant. It's always the same. It never changes its mind. You have never changed your mind. And you have seen us and you've said, I want to spend eternity with that one and that one and that one. Even though we're so impatient. We just pray, Father, that in the waiting, that we'll find courage and that we will look to you, that you'll be our everything and that people would know it when they see us. Just ask all this in Jesus' name, his powerful name. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand with me?